What do you think of love? What does the scripture say about love? What did Jesus say about love? Yes, this is one of the most important and preached topics in the Christian world, but unfortunately, one of the most misinterpreted topic too. The way I'm going to explain love today from the scriptures is going to be very, very surprising to the majority of the Christians in the Christian circles. To say the least, it's going to be very, very interesting because I'm sure most of you haven't looked at it that way. Let's look at the scriptures and see what love is. The first passage of scripture I'm going to read from is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak with languages of men and of angels, but don't have love, I have become sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but don't have love, I am nothing. If I dole out all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be buried, but don't have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient and is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't brag. It's not proud. Doesn't behave itself inappropriately. Doesn't seek its own way. It is not provoked. Takes no account of evil. Doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will be done away with. Where there are various languages, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is complete has come, then that which is partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I felt as a child. I thought as a child. Now that I have become a man, I have put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, even as I was also fully known. But now faith, hope, and love remain. These three, the greatest of these is love. Greatest of these is love. The love is above all languages, speaking in tongues, prophecy, and all that. It doesn't envy, it doesn't provoke, it doesn't seek its own approval, and it doesn't boast, it doesn't brag, it's not envious, it doesn't behave itself inappropriately, all that. This is the description of love. Now, we are not finished, we are just beginning. Romans chapter 13, verse 8 and 9, it says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. He who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandments there are, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
This is known as the last command. Jesus gave this last command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now the first condition to love your neighbor is to be able to love yourself. Now, lots of us have a problem with that to begin with. But we have to get over that. You have to love yourself and then love your neighbor. All that will be fixed if we know what love is to begin with. In 1 John chapter 2 verses 4 to 6, it explains here, again in a different way, one who says, I know him, which is meaning God, I know God, I know him, and doesn't keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth isn't in him. But whoever keeps his word, God's love has most certainly been perfected in him. This is how we know that we are in him. He who says he remains in him ought himself also to walk just like he walked. So we have to walk just like Jesus. So is, just take a note of that. We are supposed to walk just like Jesus. Uh, just one point. First of all, we found out what the description of love is, what the characteristics of love are. We read all that list of kind and being kind and not proud and not envious and all that. Rejoice with the truth. All that are the characteristics, features of love. Now, we just explained, or the Bible explains, it's not me, I'm just reading the scriptures, basically saying we have to walk the way he walked, Jesus, that is. We have to do what he did, right? And we have to keep his commandments. So this is, this is love. We're beginning just to understand the meaning of love, not the way the world teaches us. They equate love and lust together. They, they can't be any further from each other. But unfortunately, the media and the books and magazines teach, teach us from childhood that love, lust, same thing. Can't, they can't be any further apart. In Romans chapter 6 verse 23 we read again, but God, now listen to this one carefully, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, but God demonstrates his love for us, his own love for us, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. What is that? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. What is that one? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the bottom line. Now I'm going to explain further because this is not enough for people, lots of people. Christ died for us. This is the message. God's love is that he sent his son to die for our sins. Now we can't die again to be a, to be a sacrifice because an ultimate sacrifice has been already given. We, we can't replace, nobody can replace that again. So that has already been paid and done away. But let's read on and find out more about um, love. Now I want to focus now with read the descriptions and the characteristics and what love is this is love it is not talking about you know liking friends and being friends with everyone no not necessarily uh, jesus himself only had 12 disciples one of whom as he knew and he predicted was from the devil so he only really had 11 friends Although he traveled a lot, he met a lot of people, and he was Jesus, by the way. He wasn't just an ordinary man like us, like me and you. 
He was God incarnate. But he only got together 11 people as friends, who also all at one point betrayed him. In one way or the other, they all deserted him. They all returned back to Christ, they all returned to their faith, but that is not the point. The point is, what I'm trying to say is, if Jesus in all his lifetime, uh, being Jesus, only had 11 friends. If you have too many friends, if you have more than 11 friends, you have to suspect your own identification of friendship, your own definition of friendship. Just because you know somebody doesn't mean they're friends. Just because you're in contact with people, that doesn't mean they're, they're, they're friends. Friends are special people very close to you. You're lucky if you live a good life uh, and, and have one or two good, loyal friends. You're lucky. You have to count yourself lucky. But that is not the point. What I'm trying to... Let's get back to the point. Let's get back to the scriptures. Now we want to talk about the importance of love. Importance, importance of love. Now we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Again, a similar thing. If I speak with languages of men and of angels, but don't have love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. If I don't have love, I, you know, even if I'm speaking in tongues of men and angels, uh, all my abilities, uh, nothing compared to that. All my knowledge, my skills, my uh, talents, they are compared to love, they're nothing. They're considered as nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 1 and 2 says, follow after love, follow after love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. But that itself just tells you that you can earnestly desire all the spiritual gifts, especially or particularly prophesying, the gift of prophecy. If you ask and have that desire, God will give you. So that is a different sermon on its own but we're just trying to find out the importance, how important it is to have love. Follow after love and earnest, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in another language speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in the spirit he speaks mysteries. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 41, we read, Jesus said to him, this is when Jesus is talking to the rich man who is coming and asking him what he should do to enter the kingdom of God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. A second likewise is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. So it sums up all the laws and commandments if you love your neighbor as yourself. This is how important it is. And here it is likening loving your neighbor with loving God. It is saying it's the same. It's basically the same thing. You have to have that kind of love, as you have, like, as, as you have loved God, or you love God, you should love your neighbor the same way. Again, he repeats in John chapter 13, 34 and 35, Jesus is saying, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So that was just an indication for people to know that they were Jesus' disciples. 
if they had love for one another. We're still trying to figure out what love is, but I have already kind of, I've been directing you through the scriptures to get the meaning, get the meaning and the importance of love. And now I'm moving on to the results of having love. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. So simple. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, this is not a request. This is basically saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Reaction is an automatic reaction. It's, it's something that is just going to follow up after love. If you love me, keep my commandments. You will keep my commandments. Further on, I'll show you how it actually the, the scriptures actually clarify that. John chapter 14 again, verse 21. One who has my commandments and keeps them, that person is one who loves me. Can you see that now? That person is the one who loves me. One who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Basically what he's saying is, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Let's reverse this verse. If you keep my commandments, you love me. The, the reverse is true. Now let's reverse and negate the sentence. If you don't keep my commandments, you don't love me. That's still true. So if you love Jesus, if you love God, you will keep his commandments. If you're not keeping his commandments, you don't love him. Simple as that. It's so simple. But people and churches have been complicating this situation, this, this love thing, and making a big issue about it, and going around town talking about it, but they're not actually getting to the point. They're not actually getting to the point that love is following Jesus. Love is following and doing what he did himself and what he commanded us to do. We'll get there. I haven't got there yet. In John chapter 14, verse 23 and 24, Jesus answered him, If a man loves me, he will keep my word. That is clear now. Because so far you might have thought, I'm trying to interpret the word, but I haven't. This is actually the word. And where it said, if you love me, keep my commandments, like I said, this is not a request. If you love me, keep it. No. It's like a prophecy. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And that's an indication that you do love him. It's just a sign that you do love him and also others will know that you are his disciples. So you will love him. Here, very clearly and plainly is written, Jesus answered him in John chapter 14, verse 23 and 24. If a man loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me, again, back to what I was analyzing before. He who does not love me doesn't keep my words. Simple as that. The word which you hear isn't mine, but the Father's who sent me. The word which you hear isn't mine, but the Father's who sent me. It's not my word. It's my father's word, and if you follow me, you follow my word. If you love me, you will follow my word. And if you follow my words, my commandments, then you love me. It's a both way, both way equation. If you have this, you have that, and if you have that, you have this. First John chapter 3, verses 9 to 12. 
Whoever is born of God doesn't commit sin. It gets even more interesting now. Lots of people don't believe that you don't backslide. Once you are saved, you're saved. Once you love Jesus and follow his commandments, you will follow his commandments. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not a request, it's basically an order, it's a prophecy. It's the same as when God says, let there be man, let there be earth, let there be light, and there was. It's not a request. It's an order. And you will be because Jesus has said it. It's a law. It's the law of God. And you will follow. It's a prophecy. Unless you are not his follower. You don't love him to begin with. You might pretend you do love him. You might think you love him. You might wish you would love him, but you don't. You need to revisit that. You need to get back and get saved. So, 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 to 12, we read that again. Whoever is born of God doesn't commit sin. It's full stop. Because, it, for, further on it goes on, it says, because his seed remains in him. If Jesus' seed, God's seed, is in you, you just simply don't sin. And he can't sin. It goes further, even, even better. He says he can't sin. If you have God's love in you, if you're born of God, you don't commit sin. Because his seed remains in him and he can't sin. Because he is born of God. Because you're born of God, you can't sin. Now, now the controversy comes here that you think you have the choice. Yes, you have the choice. You can get off the train and go your own way. But once on the train, you have that destination. If you take the train from A to B, maybe let's say from A to Z, your destination is Z and you're going from A. You can get off the train at any time, but at any station, but your destination that God has planned for you is from A to Z. You have that whole journey planned. It's all planned out for you. But God knows who will stay on that train, who will not stay on that train. Those who will not stay on that train, they are not of God to begin with. Jesus chose 12 disciples. He chose them. They didn't choose themselves. He chose them. But one of them, he said, one of them was of the devil. But that was supposed to be, that was the plan. But he knew who would be. He has chosen you. He has chosen me. Are we going to be Judas Iscariot and get off the train and betray him? Or are we going to stay? We don't know, but he knows. In our own knowledge, we don't know. When I say we don't know, we do know because the scripture says we don't commit sin and we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tells us that we are saved. It's that the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of what is to come, as the scripture puts it. It's a guarantee. Now I'm getting into a different uh, topic of backsliding, which is another controversial uh, hot topic in the Christian world. And uh, I personally don't believe in backsliding. Uh, you, you have the choice all the way, but once you're saved, you're truly saved. You will know you're saved and you will not backslide. If backsliding is in a sense that, I'm just saying it very quickly and briefly because it's just, it's, I had to mention this, um, because uh, if, if you mean by backsliding, if you mean just going away your own way for a few days or months or so and come back, that is not backsliding. Lots of people have done that. In fact, all the disciples did that. I could just touch on it briefly. All the disciples went their own way 
after Jesus died. They all one way or the other either denied him or deserted him one way or the other and, and then they, they came back but Jesus knew they were all saved and he says to the Father when he's praying he says not I haven't lost not even one of them I have not lost any of them apart from the one that was supposed to be the betrayer but he was from the devil himself and, and he knew that from the beginning like Jesus knew that from the beginning. But anyway, we, we get back to this. So, let's read again. Whoever is born of God doesn't commit sin because his seed remains in him and he can't sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are revealed. Again, it's a reference again back to what Jesus was saying. This is how they will know you're my disciples. In this, the children of God are revealed and the children of the devil. So, so if you don't follow his commandments, you're a child of the devil. Simple as that. Whoever doesn't do righteousness is not of God. Neither is he who doesn't love his neighbor. So simple. But churches don't read into this properly. For this is the message which you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 8 to 12, it reads, But all these things are the beginning of birth pains. Now Jesus is talking, Jesus is talking about the signs of the end time. And he's saying these things will happen. Now, uh, with, this, with this scripture, I want to show you why people don't love anymore. Don't have that kind of love in them. Don't have that kind of love that God is talking about, the scriptures are talking about, which we've been talking about now, which we've been reading and explaining. Why people don't have that kind of love? What is the reason? So the reason is there in Matthew chapter 24 verses 8 to 12 when he's explaining about the end time, signs of the end, end time and he says, but all these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to oppression and will kill you. This is about Christians. You will be hated by all of the nations for my name's sake. Then many will stumble and will deliver up one another and will hate one another. You can see what's happening now that the world is getting corrupted and it is the end time and people are delivering each other up and they hate Christians for Jesus' name's sake and will hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will lead many astray. That's another reason. Prophets, false prophets will arise and lead many people astray. And because iniquity will be multiplied, the love of many will grow cold. Sin increases so much that the love of many will grow cold. It's basically the main reason. Now, what about, what are the consequences of not having love? Let's read from the scriptures again. John chapter 8 verse 30 to 44. It reads, As he spoke these things, many believed in him. Jesus therefore said to those Jews, now watch this, Jesus said to those Jews who had believed him. Now they believed him. Now listen to this. If you remain in my word, then you are truly my disciples. So, did they believe in him or did they not? Because it's saying clearly that he spoke and said to those Jews who had believed in him. Believed him. Jesus therefore said to those Jews who had believed him. 
These are the ones who believed him. If you remain in me, if you remain in my word, then you are truly my disciples. So he is saying he knows they are not true disciples. He knows that. Because it's just putting that question there. If you remain, it's putting that condition there. If you remain in my word, then you are my true disciples. He knows they're not. They're, they're not his disciples. They're not his true disciples anyway. That is why he puts that there. He puts that kind of conditional thing there. Conditional salvation. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. He's poking them now. He's saying you will know the truth, which is Jesus, and the truth will set you free. Straight away you can see the reaction. They answered him, we are Abraham's offspring and have never been in bondage to anyone. How do you say you will be made free? How you, why are you saying this? We are Abraham's offspring. We've never been in bondage. We are free. Jesus answered them, Most certainly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is the bond servant of sin. So he knows that they sin. A bond servant doesn't live in the house forever. I know. A son remains forever. No. Listen to this, he's following it to get a conclusion out of this. If therefore the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's offspring, yet you seek to kill me. I know that you are Abraham's offspring, genetically, yes, but you seek to kill me, because my word finds no place in you. You don't love me, you don't have any love for me and you don't follow my commandments. That is how I know that you are not Abraham's offspring, although you are. You are genetically, but you're not Abraham's. Which he goes on and he explores that further. I know that you are Abraham's offspring, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I say that. I say the things which I have seen with my father, and you also do the things which you have seen with your father. I do whatever I have seen with my father, and you are doing whatever you have seen with your father. They answered him, Our father is Abraham. Again, our father is Abraham. What are you saying? Jesus said to them, Now, he, first, just a couple of Seconds ago, he just said, I know you're Abraham's offspring. But here, he's saying, no, you're not. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. You do the works of your father. You understand what, what he's doing is just poking them, he's just poking them, he's just poking them and provoking them to see what they're saying, to, to get their real face out, to show their real side, their real face, because he knew they are sinners. And because of Abraham's, because of Abraham, because of their ancestor, he knew they were sinners. But because they were boasting about their ancestor Abraham, and they were relying on that, that ancestry and relying on Abraham's righteousness, he is just saying it has nothing to do with that. Absolutely nothing. Not even a bit. Now, I have written another article about uh, G Jews and Jesus, whether G Jesus was Jew. That's another topic that churches keep talking about and having the, their own disputes and arguments over it. Um, I've written an extensive article on that. You can read all about it. But this is what he's saying very clearly. He says, Abraham didn't do this. You do the works of your father. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We are not illegitimate children. We have one father, 
God. Now they go further. They say, our father is God. It becomes interesting. Therefore, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. Now, I'll get back to our subject again. You would love me. Now, there you go. I've caught you here. You don't love me. Because, it goes on, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came out and have come from God. For I haven't come of myself, but he sent me. Why don't you understand my speech? Why don't you understand my speech? It's so clear. The same I'm saying now to the church. Why don't you understand Jesus' speech? It's so clear. Because you can't hear my word. He's explaining why they can't understand it. Because they can't hear his word. You are of your father. You are of your father. The devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and doesn't stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks on his own for he is a liar and its father. He's the father of lies. He is the liar and he's been a murderer from the beginning. And when he's speaking lies, when he lies, he is speaking his native language. So, what should we do? Let's look at the scripture. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 35. But I tell you, who hear, love your enemies. But I tell you, who hear, you who are hearing this message, Jesus is saying, love your enemies. He understands obviously that we have enemies. He says, love your enemies. We can't possibly like our enemies. So obviously there is a difference between liking and loving. You don't have to necessarily like your neighbor or your enemies, but you are supposed to love them. How do we do that? The Bible teaches us how. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. To him who strikes you on the cheek, offer also the other. And for him who takes away your cloak, don't withhold your coat also. Give to everyone who asks you, and don't ask him who takes away your goods to give them back again. As you would like people to do to you, do exactly so to them. Do to others as you have them do unto you. It's a very proactive command. In other faiths and other religions, it is quite opposite. It says, do to, basically they're saying, they teach other faiths, other religions. They teach you do what they did to you. you know? But Jesus is saying, do to others as you would have them do unto you. If you like somebody to treat you a certain way, you start. You treat them that way. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? If you love somebody of your mates, they, they love you already. What credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive back as much. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing back. Lend expecting nothing back. Now, no church teaches this. They all say, give and you shall be given, which is not exactly strictly according to the context. It's not contextual. They're taking that out of the context. And that's another uh, message. And I'll talk about that in another uh, video 
about giving and receiving and offering and all that, which is again misinterpreted, totally misinterpreted in, in churches. Expecting nothing, that is the secret. Expect nothing back. That is the secret to giving. But well, let's just move on from here because this is not actually what we're talking about in this subject. And you reward you and your reward will be great, and you will and your reward will be great, and you will be children of the most high, for he is kind towards the unthankful and evil. He is kind toward the unthankful and evil. I read further from Matthew chapter 10 verse 37 when Jesus is saying, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me isn't worthy of me. Jesus is just putting that into perspective to show you how much you have to love Jesus and how much you have to basically abide in him and follow his commandments. Your love for your family should be the next priority. It shouldn't be the first priority. It should, the first priority should be God, Jesus and his commandments. Not you mother, not your father, not your son, not your daughter. And doesn't, this verse doesn't say hate them. This doesn't say don't love them. It just says simply, if you love them more than me, then really you're not worthy of me. You have to love me more than them. Let's move on. I'm, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Just, just bear with me. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 to 35 now. Don't think that I came to send peace on the earth. I didn't come to send peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man at odds against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Again, this doesn't mean that you have to be fighting with each other. This means that I have come. Jesus is saying that I have come because of me, because of some people's love for me, they will move away from those people, even their father, their mother. They will have to put their family behind them and follow Jesus and Jesus' commandments. Because of that, that's why he's saying this, that, you, that he has come to set a man at odds against his family. Uh, doesn't mean you have to actually fight with your family. It doesn't mean that at all. Uh, all it just means is that uh, when you follow Jesus, you will have enemies and your enemies might be even from within your family, your own immediate family. So be prepared for that. If you are a true follower of Christ, and you want to love him and love his commandments and follow his commandments, you will have these things. So don't just presume everything is going to be nice and hunky-dory. Right. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and doesn't disregard his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he can't be my disciple. So he can't be his disciple if you don't love Jesus that much that the other things, you disregard them. You don't disregard them as in they don't matter anymore. No, not at all. He is just trying to put that into perspective for people to understand that your love for Jesus and his commandments should be far above anything else. Simple as that. Now, how do we have to act in love? How do we act in love? And with that, that will lead to the conclusion. Now, first, first, I need to read from Romans chapter 14, verses 12 to 18. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So you will give an account of yourselves to God. 
and I will give an account of myself to God. So you, you're not responsible for me as such. You're responsible, we're all responsible for each other, but you're not responsible for my sins, if that makes sense. And that, again, that is opening another message. We're only responsible to guide and lead people uh, so they're not going astray and um, correct people from their errors, from their um, wrong ways. If they're going the wrong way, we have to correct them. We have the responsibility. But if uh, we've given the corrections and they don't want to, then that's up to them. We've done our duty. Um, but if we do correct them, then we have covered a multitude of sins according to the scriptures. So that is a different message again, but what I'm saying is we are all responsible for our own um, deeds. I'm not giving an account of your actions, your deeds, and you're not giving an account of my deeds. I'm not relying on your good deeds and you cannot rely on my good deeds or your father's good deeds or your forefather's good deeds like they were trying to do uh, with Abraham. So, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block to obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. Now, if you consider certain meat, certain food unclean, then that is unclean for you. Paul is writing here that he is certain nothing on his own is unclean. If you, give, if you can give thanks for it, uh, if you can give thanks to God for it and bless it, then it's clean. That's his take. Now, if you if your take, your opinion is that this is unclean, I don't like this, it is unclean for you, it will affect you, it will make you sick. Now, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. Don't you think you're destroying someone's faith by acting in such a way that you're eating something that this other guy or other woman is considering as unclean? You're, you're eating it in front. You, let's just imagine you eat horse meat and you know you think it's clean. Your faith allows that for you to eat. Your faith allows you to eat that, but my faith doesn't allow me to eat horse meat or donkey's meat. So you're eating in front of me, you just disgust me. And, and uh, to me, I feel like you're not even faithful. You, you have no faith. You're not following God's command. So it just destroys and distresses me and, and it, it's not good. So you're not acting in love, basically. That's what he's saying. Therefore, do not let what you know, therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. So you might think it is good, let it not be spoken of as evil by doing that in front of me or in front of somebody that you know. You can't accept that. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. So if you act in this way, you not only please God, but also receive human approvals as well. Because people will be happy. You're not disgusting them. Now, I only mentioned this. This is, this is only just showing you how delicate it is to act in love. Now, I'm just still getting there. I haven't got there. <laughs> I'm still getting there. We haven't got much there, much to get there, but we haven't got much to get there, but I'm getting there. But this is just 
the, I showed you this scripture just to say how delicate it is. You have to act, you have to be completely aware all the time, 24 7, aware of every single move that you make. Everything that you do has to be in off. Reading on from Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, Jesus went about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. The report about him went out into all Syria. They brought to him all who were sick, afflicted with various diseases and torments, possessed with demons, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Just, did you just see what Jesus did? He went about preaching, healing the sick, and driving demons out. Three main things. Preaching the good news, the gospel, which brings salvation, healing the sick, and driving out demons. The three main things that he also commissioned every disciple to do. This is what he did in his ministry. Do you understand? This is what Jesus did in his ministry. We read from the scriptures, Jesus says, if you love me, you will do what I command you, my commandments. His last great commission, his last command was love. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another. Great commission was go into all the world and preach the gospel and heal the sick. So this is love. We're coming back to that. So if you want to show your love, this is how you show your love. This is how you show your love. You act in love by showing the gospel to them, preaching the gospel to people, healing them, and driving demons out of them, casting demons out of them if they are possessed or afflicted by demons or spiritual forces. This is what he did. And we read from the beginning, we read in 1 John, chapter 2 verse 4 to 6 he said one who says i know him and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar the truth isn't in him but well, whoever keeps his word god's love has most certainly been perfected in him this is how we know that we are in him he who says he remains in him ought himself also to walk just like he did just like jesus walked we have to walk how did he walk he preached the good news, he healed the sick, and he delivered the possessed. Again, we read from the, going back to what we read, we, we read earlier in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the gospel. So this is God's love. What we have to do, we have to follow his commandments. Follow him and follow his pattern. His pattern is that he sent Jesus to die for us. Now we're not dying again. We are preaching that good news to the rest of the world. That is love. You're acting in love and showing that to everyone. That Jesus died, you preach the gospel, you heal the sick and... You deliver them which are the three main things that we are doing with our own website preaching the gospel healing the sick and delivering the oppressed or possessed and we're focusing on those three reading on from Luke chapter 9 verse 3 to 7 he said to them take nothing for your journey now this is when Jesus actually commissioned his disciples to go and preach the good news. Take nothing for your journey, neither staffs, 
no wallet, no bread, no money. Neither have two coats apiece. Into whatever house you enter, stay there and depart from there. He said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither staffs, nor wallet, nor bread, nor money. Neither have two coats apiece. Into whatever house you enter, stay there and depart from there. As many as don't receive you when you depart from that city, shake off even the dust from your feet for a testimony against them. So this is saying basically he's telling them to go and preach the gospel and stay in one house if they welcome you, stay in that house, preach the gospel and depart from that house. If they don't accept you, shake off the dust of your sandals as a testimony against them. So you've done your job, you've done your duty, you've done your commission. It's now their responsibility, it's on their head. So this is what he said, he said preach. This is the commission, this is love. Now, in Mark chapter 16, this is now, I'm closing with this verse uh, and, and getting into the conclusion. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 18, 15 to 18. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 18. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who disbelieves will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. Now, these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new languages, they will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will in no way hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So you, see, you can see again He's given them the power, he's given them the authority, he's given them the Holy Spirit, and he says, when you do this, uh, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and when you do that, those who believe, believe and get baptized will be saved. Those who don't believe will not be saved, and in fact will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. These signs will also accompany those who preach because they were his disciples, they are following him, his pattern, his love, his commandments. So uh, you, you'll be able to uh, cast out demons, and speak new languages and take up serpents and if you drink any deadly thing it will in no way hurt you. They will lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover, and that's healing. So, there you have it. Jesus' love, and Gospel's love, the Bible's love, or the topic of love is explored here. Love, what is love? We know what love is. Love is, apart from all the features and characteristics of love, love basically is the fact that you have to love your neighbor so much, you love your enemy so much that you give them the gospel. This is the conclusion. You give them the gospel of Christ, that Jesus died for their sins, for our sins, for everybody's sins. If they receive it, they will be saved. If they don't receive it, they are condemned. And you heal them and you deliver them from demonic oppressions. This is love. Now you can see what love is according to the scripture and what we are supposed to do. Love is not making friends all around the world and be in contact with them 24-7 and send them nice messages and like their posts on Facebook and uh, keep adding new friends on, on Facebook and other media. That is not love that Jesus is talking about. Love is, am I not like you personally? You've done lots of 
bad things to me, you've done lots of hurtful things to me, I don't personally like you, but I love you so much that I give you the gospel, I preach the gospel to you, and I'll give you the healing if you need, I will heal, I'll lay hands on you and pray for you, bless you, and cast demons out of you if you're oppressed or possessed by demonic forces. This is my love. This is God's love. This is not my personal love. This is love that God has put in us as Christians. And if we don't have that love, we are not abiding in Him. This is the conclusion. If you don't have God's love, you're not in God. You're not of God. You're not in Jesus. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son to die for us. While we we're still sinners, He died for us. He demonstrated his love that way. He didn't become friends with us, like uh, coming here and liking our messages and sending like mysterious, miraculous likes on our posts. It's not about getting close to people and being chatty with everyone uh, around the corner or in the streets or in our church or in our clubs. No. Love, as the Bible puts it, is that way that you love them so much that you give them the Bible the gospel you tell them about Jesus and you preach the gospel basically and you heal them if they need healing and you cast demons out of them if they need deliverance which are the three main focus of our ministry which are the three main topics that we focus on in our ministry. May God richly bless you and I hope and trust that this has opened your eyes and has given you something to think of. God bless you.